Targi. It's Targi, right? Is it Targi? I feel like it's gotta be Targi. Maybe I should have Googled this before I sat down to film. Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. If you are a new viewer, welcome. You caught us right in the middle of our wool series where we are talking about different sheep breeds and how the wool they produce has different characteristics and what those characteristics are good for, what that means for our crafting, whether it's knitting, crochet, spinning, etc. If you are a returning viewer, welcome back. And yes, we are going to do another episode of our wool series today. We took a break for the last couple weeks to just talk about some things that I'm knitting and just talk about other things going on, um, just because I felt like we needed a little other content besides only talking about different sheep breeds. You know, if you're in school all the time, that gets a little bit crazy. You need recess every now and then, right? So we took a little break and now we're back. We're gonna talk about another sheep breed today. So welcome, welcome. But before we jump into talking about our sheep breed for the day, I have something very exciting that I know everybody's on the edge of their seat about. So I wanted to announce the winner of our giveaway. For the last three weeks, we have been doing a giveaway here on the Color Cauldron podcast. In order to win, you had to be a subscriber to my channel and you had to leave a comment on at least one of the videos from the last three weeks. You could enter up to three times by leaving one comment for each video or you could enter just once by leaving one comment on one of the three videos. Thank you so much to everybody who participated and took the time to leave a comment. Thank you for all my new subscribers who joined in on the fun and for a chance to win some great stuff. And I'm just really, really excited that we had such great participation on the podcast. Remember, this was only open to podcast viewers. So even though I mentioned it on my Instagram and Facebook, you had to be a subscriber and viewer here on YouTube of the podcast in order to win. It was not eligible to anybody outside of the YouTube platform. So for all of you guys who are eligible, thank you so much. And competition was fierce this time around. This is our second giveaway we've done on the podcast and I was just really excited how many people joined in on the fun and yeah, I'm excited. This is a really good prize and I'm going to show you what um, the winner is going to take home with them before we announce who it is. The first one is, this is my bag, but the winner is going to win a bag that looks exactly like this, but is all folded up nice and neat and wrapped up in plastic. Um, so this is the one I've been using for the last several weeks by Georgian of the Stitching Plaza. Thank you, Georgian, for donating. It's this incredible potion bottles bag. So all these little bottles have fun little labels on them like powdered skeleton and crack and tears and things like that. So um, you're going to get, uh, the winner is going to get one of these and um, it fits a lot of yarn in there. We can actually get quite a bit in there. So I'm really excited about that. That is kind of the highlight of the giveaway, but there's more. I'm stuffing it with lots of goodies. The first thing is two skeins of my hand dyed yarn. I'm going to include a skein of my Polworth. This is the Freya DK base. So it's 100% Superwash Polworth, 246 yards, and the colorway is called Tea with a Bashful Griffin. And it was one that was in the shop um, a little over a year ago in kind of a nice summery blend of colors. And then I'm also including a, an original prototype of my Harvest Moon colorway on the Gaia Fingering which is 100% superwash merino. I have since redone the recipe for Harvest Moon just a little bit, so it still has all the same colors in it, but this one is very, very orange and gold heavy, and the new one has even more of the burgundy and brown in it, so it's got um, a little bit more color variation, but the same types of colors. And I just love this colorway because it's very, very fall, and um, it just seems like pumpkin spice lattes and tall boots and, infinity scarves and sweaters. So perfect for going into fall, coming out of summer and going into fall. So you'll get one each of those uh, skeins. And last but definitely not least, you will also get a handcrafted stitch marker. This is from um, Wanda at Silly Sheep Designs. This is an anatomical heart that she handmade out of polymer clay, and it's incredible in all the detail. It's a kind of a dark red maroon color, kind of like my shirt, and then she dipped it in a black glitter, so it's got this really cool glaze over it, um, glitter glaze, and these stitch markers are the bomb. I love Wanda's uh, stitch markers. 
I have more of her stitch markers than anybody else. <laughs> and um, I'm always finding more that I want to get. So you should go check out her shop, which I will leave a link to below. I'm also gonna leave a link to the Stitching Plaza shop below as well. So you'll find my shop link with Stitching Plaza and Silly Sheep Designs right below it. So you can go check out all of the goodies if you are not the winner. And even if you are, you might wanna add to it. So who won? Dun, 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 dun. We used a random number generator to decide who it was. So basically I just totaled up all the comments that you guys left on all three of the videos. I popped them into a random number generator. It spewed out a number and then I went down through the list starting with the first video oldest comment was number one and then we went up through all those comments then number two oldest comment number three oldest comment etc and the winner is Melanie Burns yay Melanie so I'm really really excited for you Melanie I'm so grateful to everybody who entered and I can't wait to send these things your way now unfortunately because of the way YouTube is set up I'm not sure if I have a good um, contact email or phone number for you so Melanie what you can do to help me out is please contact me as soon as you see this video I'm gonna try to find a way to get a hold of you but in case I don't um, just get it in touch with me you can either email me potionyarns at gmail.com or you can um, just go to my website there's a little contact form you can fill out that'll send me an email or you can contact me on Instagram or Facebook either way whatever is easiest for you I check all of those messages pretty pretty frequently so congratulations, Melanie. Melanie does have one week to claim her prize, only one week because I do have to get these things moved out of my house. I just don't have enough room to store everything right now. So if for whatever reason Melanie doesn't get a hold of me within the first week or if we find out that there's some kind of an issue and she's not able to claim her prize, I will select a new name, a new number and a new name at the end of that time. So next week we will pick a new winner if I haven't heard from Melanie yet. So Melanie, get get to me right away. Um, but yeah, I will let you know how that goes. I'll let you know if Melanie claims the prize. If we pick a new winner, I'll let you know that as well. But for right now, we'll assume Melanie's gonna get it and these goodies will be sent her way very, very soon. Thank you so much for everybody for participating. Okay, let's move on to the next thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, are you coming up? Phoebe's coming up today. This is Phoebe. She is, she is my sweet baby. I have three rescue kitties and they're all quite sweet, but they don't always get along. So the other two are kind of in timeout right now. They had a little bit of a kerfuffle this morning and the other two are upstairs cooling their heels off because they tend to gang up and beat up on poor little Phoebe. So yeah, we're, don't worry, she's not defenseless. I think she actually started it. She kind of had some attitude this morning and they were like, uh-uh girl. So we're gonna let them cool off. Um, <laughs> but while we are letting them chill and become normal humans again. Um, normal humans, they're cats, but whatever, you know, normal, nice kitties to be around. Um, I wanted to share a couple things that I have finished and been knitting on before we jump into our wool series. So first thing is a finished object. I actually finished this a little over a week ago. Um, so I've mentioned on here before that I'm doing the box of socks cowl, cal, excuse me, the knit along. Um, so every month you knit a pair of socks and at the end of the year you have at least 12, sometimes more if you're really prolific and you get a lot done. I tend to like knitting socks and I almost always have socks on the needles, but I'd never done like, I, I'd never really done a cal or anything like that where I was supposed to produce a certain amount. So I decided to take the challenge this year because I was like, I'm pretty sure I can do at least one pair a month. Um, now it has been a little tricky on some months because I've been knitting a lot of garments this year as well So a lot of cardigans and pullovers and stuff and so it got a little bit tricky But I have managed to complete a pair every single month sometimes by the skin of my teeth including this month I waited um, in August like an idiot um, I waited until like the 20th or 21st of August to even cast on so I had like a week and a half but I busted it out. I did cheat slightly because I picked a shorty sock so that it would be um, a lot quicker. I didn't have as much of the, the leg part to knit. And I am just obsessed with cute lacy little cuffs and like cuffs that fold over really low on your foot. So like a little short sock with a, a cute little lacy cuff and then you wear them with like T-strap heels or cute little vintage inspired pumps with low squat kind of fat heels only like two inches tall or so and like a little ankle strap or a T-strap or something like that. So I just love having that like vintage shoe look with a cute lacy little cuff. So I decided I need more of those in my life and I only have one or two pairs that I knit like years and years ago that are starting to get really old. So I knit um, the penis poop cake waffle socks 
and I apologize that they're not looking super clean. I did actually wear them to work yesterday and last night to bed, and then I completely forgot to um, like wash them before the podcast, so they're um, not looking phenomenal. <laughs> but um, that was the first time I'd gotten to wear them, and they felt amazing. But I really loved this little pattern. So um, it is not G-rated because it has little uh, phallic-shaped lace that you create with bobbles and some cute little um, lace at the top. The cuff is actually pretty easy to do, and you knit it... Um, and then knit down so it is from the cuff down to the toe. Pretty easy though because like I said the foot part is or the leg part is very very short and then you get right into the foot although you could make it longer if you wanted. And then I just loved the pattern that is on this foot. I don't know if you can see this. Ooh. Um, but it's this little waffle stitch um, which is actually really easy to do. It's like a four stitch repeating pattern. So it's quick to memorize. It's super, super easy. It's just knits and purls. Most of it's just slipping and knitting. And then every like third row or something, you purl a few of the stitches and it's just phenomenal. And then they used um, a heel that was very, sim they didn't call it this and it's not exactly, but it's very similar to the Fish Lips Kiss heel on um, on the heel part. And this is a free pattern on Ravelry. I will post the link below so you can go check that out. Um, they do have a G-rated version if you prefer not to have little phallic images on your lace. Um, they do have a G-rated version that I didn't even bother to look at, so I don't know how different it is, but I went ahead and made the full R-rated version because I thought it was funny and interesting, and I kind of love bubbles personally. I know they're a hotly debated um, stitch for a lot of people, but I kind of love bubbles. I think they're kind of amazing. So that's what I finished, and then I have been working like a mad woman, and if you're following my Instagram, particularly my IGTV, which I did want to mention on here because it's amazing, um, if you guys haven't checked out IGTV, I highly recommend you do it. I have been using IGTV personally as a short little mini vlog kind of style. So I post videos, I don't manage to get one every single day, um, but I try to do several a week and I post a very short video. It's usually under 10 minutes. I had one last night that went 13 minutes and that's like my longest one that I've done. Usually they're anywhere from two to five minutes, sometimes 10, and it's basically just little snippets into my life. So one that I did really early on, I was dyeing yarn and I um, just held the camera up and started talking and was like, hey, I'm dyeing some yarn, here's what's happening, and I shared the story of how that particular colorway came about because it had kind of a convoluted history. And so I explained what was, what happened, What, how I made this oopsie mistake, and then I turned it into this other thing, and then it turned it out to be a really great selling colorway, and now it's one of my favorites, and all these things. So I share the story behind the dyeing. Um, sometimes I share little videos, like one time I did a video showing me prepping orders to go out shipping, and so I talked about shipping out orders, and um, you know some of the challenges of working out of your home when you have to do dyeing and shipping and labeling and getting ready for shows and all these other things plus you have cats and a husband that you're trying to keep out of yarn plus you're um you know you're just busy and you've got a little old house that has some issues and you know i just talk about my life and things that are happening and then sometimes i just show things i'm working on or knitting sometimes i talk about my neighborhood or what's going on in my life at the hair salon or whatever so i highly encourage you to check that out um, I don't know how it is on an Android phone because I have an iPhone. I used to be all Android and last year I switched to an iPhone. So um, on the iPhone, I have the Instagram app on my phone. And so when I log in and I open my app, um, in the top right hand corner, there's a little icon that looks like it's kind of orange and it has a little TV on it. And if you click on the TV icon, it takes you to IGTV where um, you can follow, like anybody you're following on Instagram, if they have a channel, you can find it on there by clicking the following tab and then scrolling through, or you can search for specific channels. You can search for Potion Yarns and look up my IGTV. Um, you can look up other people's. They have recommended suggestions based on videos that you have watched or um, people that you follow. So like I follow a lot of knitters, and so I'm constantly getting um, recommended videos from other people who are talking about knitting or showing how to do a slip slip knit or whatever it is. So I really recommend you check it out because I, Sometimes we'll post my IGTV videos on my Facebook page, but it's different content than I have here on the podcast, and I don't post everything over on Facebook either, so um, it's kind of a little bit of a different thing. It's more of my videos, but more of my like day-to-day -day behind the scenes and just short little snippets, and um, yeah, I highly recommend you check it out. So if you missed the IGTV video from this last week where I was talking about the um, alterations that I made to my floozy cardigan, 
then I'm going to go over those really quickly so you can hear. So I am making great progress on my floozy. I am down to the bottom hem now. I just started the ribbing this morning for the bottom hem. So um, yeah, I'm about done with the body and I have the sleeves on holders so I need to go back and pick up those and knit down the sleeves. And then I will just do the button band in the front and sew on some buttons and I'll be done. So yeah, still got a ways to go, but I'd say I'm about two thirds. Well, maybe not quite, at least half to somewhere between half and two thirds. But I got the color work yoke done pretty early on because that's what you start with. And I made some adjustments to mine. So in the pattern, you have three colors. You've got uh, the speckle for your body, um, if you're using a speckled yarn. And then you've got two contrast colors that you do in the yoke. And um, the pattern has color B, which is the white here, you start with at the top these little blips of color would actually be the white in the pattern as written and then after blips of white then you have the white background and then you bring in color c which for me on mine is the dark pink color and then this part is as the pattern was written so the pink would be in the middle but in the pattern you only have pink here here and here and then the rest is white but i started knitting mine and i just didn't love having that much white I'm not a very big white fan, I'm more of a color fan, and I really liked the, the really strong contrast of the dark pink as opposed to the light pink. So I decided to switch my colors. So I started with color C. I did, I did the stitches exactly as it's written, but I used color C up here. And then when we got down here, I switched to color B. And so this part is exactly as the pattern is written from about here down to here. It's exactly the way you do it in the pattern. And then I went back to color C instead of color B for these bottom blips as well. That just gave me more of the pink as opposed to the white. Now the white does look nice on my cardigan kit that I created. It's a more subtle contrast because your main color is so light already, but it's still enough of a contrast that it looks really pretty. So you can do it exactly as the pattern is written, but if you prefer more of a contrast or if you just like don't have enough yarn. So that's another thing. I was trying not to use a full skein and just use a mini skein of my white that I had left over. So um, I was like, you know what? This way I don't have to worry about grabbing another mini or breaking up with a whole new cake of yarn. I'm just gonna use up the leftovers and um, just have less white so that I can do that. So if you buy a sweater kit from my shop, I do still have the floozy cardigan kits in my shop. They're only gonna be up for another week or so, but you can grab, go grab them. Um, and if you grab one of the ones from my shop, instead of sending you minis that are, um, you know, the just what you would need for the pattern, I actually send you a full skein of each of the contrast colors, as well as enough skeins to do the body in the main color. So you'll get a full skein of white and a full skein of pink if you get the girly kit, like the one that I'm using. That gives you so many options because you can add extra color work if you want because you're only gonna be using about 100 yards of each of these, um, maybe 120, some, somewhere in that range, and you get 438 yards of each of those colors. So you can add an extra band of color work at the bottom if you want. You can take your color work down further if you want. You can go further down the sleeves or add more color work on the, on the um, wrist of the sleeve. You can make a contrast color button band and do all white or all pink or white and pink stripes for your button band if you want. Um, so you have so many options because you are given extra yarn than what you need, which is why I like to throw in a full skein. That way you have extras if you want to make like pink and white stripey fingerless gloves to go with your floozy when you're done, you've got enough to do that. If you want to add extra color work or change the color order around, you're not locked into doing the pattern as written. Some kits that I have looked at purchasing or have purchased in the past, um, they will give you like if the pattern says you need a 25 gram mini skein for the contrast color, they will only give you the 25 gram mini skein. And then if you wanna switch colors and you're like, you know what, I want more of the gold than the blue, so I'm gonna use extra gold. You don't have that option because you only get the mini skein. Whereas with mine, you have the option to play around, change it however you want, make it your own. So I highly encourage you to do that, but I just wanted to share with you guys what I'm doing on mine so that you would have those options. Okay, there's one other thing I wanna show you and then we are gonna jump right into our wool series. And I'm just gonna talk very briefly about this because I don't want this to take too long and I have a feeling you're gonna be seeing this a lot in the future. But I went ahead and started my Eshell sweater, which in case you don't remember, because I can never remember what it's called. I had to look that up before starting filming today. Um, the Eshell is the Moon Phase Pullover from Pom Pom Magazine, featured here on the cover. So it's this color work. Um, pullover and I mentioned it on the podcast a couple weeks ago that I had just gotten the um, 
magazine and I was so excited about it and I was definitely gonna cast this on but I couldn't decide on my colors. So I showed you guys some colors, some of you guys left me some feedback um, and I mentioned that I was thinking about dyeing up a new colorway. I did it, I couldn't resist. So I created a really dark, moody, teal tonal background color. Um, so here is one of my skeins that I caked up for my sweater of what that looks like. It is absolutely gorgeous. It turned out so, so good. I can't even tell you how happy I am with this color. And so far I have only dyed it on my Dryad sock, which is my Merino cashmere and nylon um, sock yarn, which is what I'm using for my sweater. That is the fiber content that they use in the sample in Pom Pom Magazine. And I was like, I haven't made a sweater with my Dryad base. I've made some shawls with it and absolutely loved knitting with it, but I hadn't tried a sweater yet. So I decided I was gonna use it. And oh my God, it feels amazing in my hands and I don't know what it is about this yarn you guys but I've done quite a bit of color work like stranded knitting in the past and the more I do it the better I'm getting at not pulling my floats too tightly so it doesn't pucker while I'm knitting as much but I still usually have a little bit of puckering here and there especially if I have long runs of one color where I have to catch the floats on the back and you know it all comes out when I block it and it looks perfect after blocking but sometimes while I'm knitting it there's just a slight bit of uneven tension or some like really loose stitches followed by a couple tight stitches and something about this dryad sock yarn I've never used it for anything other than shawls and I've never used it for stranded color work before this but I am obsessed with it I haven't blocked anything yet and it's like perfection like it doesn't even look like it needs to be blocked it's laying so perfect and even I probably will block it because I have a feeling like I could make it even smoother, but like it doesn't look like it needs it. I feel like I could cast this off and wear it immediately and it would be just fine. So I am 100% in love with the Dryad sock and who knew it was going to be amazing for color work, but it is. So I absolutely love that. And so that's my background color is this really great dark teal, which I've decided to call Ancient Ritual. So that will be going in the shop very soon. And my contrast color, I did decide to go ahead and do the Blood Moon. I mentioned that on the podcast before, and I was like, you know, I kind of want to do a Blood Moon and do like this orangey red called Dragon's Breath that's been in the shop for quite some time. And I decided I'd do it. I happen to have an extra skein um, in the shop of the Fairy Wing, which is my Merino and Silk, 80% Merino, 20% Silk fingering. And it's a two-ply. So I had an extra skein of Dragon's Breath in this base and I just decided instead of waiting until I dyed up some more of the MCN, I was just gonna use what I had on hand, which was this Merino Silk. And I actually love the two together. You can't even tell a big difference in the textures. I think they look really, really lovely together. I am enjoying them and they're both kind of luxury yarns. So I feel like this is gonna be a very special sweater. So I love it. I did knit a swatch beforehand, but I didn't, um, I don't have my swatch with me, so I'm just showing you the sweater. It wasn't very big. I was very, very excited to cast on my sweater, so I did not follow the rules and knit the full, like, you know, four inches in the round, the full amount that I should have done. I just knit a little ways, just enough to see that there was enough contrast in the colors. And then I was like, you know what? I love these colors together. They look perfect. It's not, I was worried that there wouldn't be enough contrast because of how dark both of them are in the top for these tiny little, like, blips of color but and my swatch I was like you know what I can totally tell this is going to be amazing so I'm just going to go for it so I cast on my sweater right away and it's going swimmingly I am not quite to the armholes yet so I have made pretty good progress um but I'm not ready to split for the armholes quite yet but getting close I think so yeah I'm loving it I totally think it's great it is a very complicated pattern so I don't want to scare you um if you've never done color work before though I would not recommend this as your first project um there's just there's a lot of charts and they're very very intricate and it requires you to really pay attention most of the sweater um, most of the time in the sweater you're jumping back and forth between okay knit the second half of this chart then knit this chart over here and then knit this the back half of this chart and then go over here and it's back and forth all the time so I highly recommend that if you have never done stranded color work I mean I'm not going to tell you you can't I think you're smart enough you can figure anything out, but just beware, it's very, very complicated and there are easier color work patterns to get you started um, in stranded knitting if you would like to start with something a little simpler before you jump into something this complicated. Now, if you've done color work before or if you're like, I don't care, I'm smart enough, I can figure it out, I'm just going to go for it, um, don't get scared off. It is complicated, 
but it just requires reading your knitting, like Elizabeth Zimmerman talks about, really paying attention to where you're at and really um, making sure you keep track of where you are in your chart. So I use the bright colored post-it notes and move them up every chart. Um, some people use like apps on their phone or iPad. Whatever you use that helps you, definitely use it. You will need it for this one. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into talking about our Targi. I was going to do this wool series today and I was thinking about switching over to medium wools and then I remembered we haven't talked about Targi yet and it's like an amazing fine wool. Um, it's actually, it was included in the fine wool category in Clara Parks' Knitter's Book of Wool, which is why I'm calling it a fine wool, but I feel like it's kind of like on the, it teeter-totters the line between fine wool and medium wool to me. So I'm not really sure what its official categorization is, but we're gonna talk about Targi today. So. First of all, I did have to look up Targi and how to pronounce it. I've called it Targi for years and just assumed that was right. And then I suddenly, when I sat down to film this, had this like moment where I went, I don't actually know that that's how you pronounce it. And I couldn't remember anyone ever saying it around me before, only typing it like online. So I actually did Google it and found out that you do pronounce it Targi, not Targi or Targi. So Targi wool is what we're talking about today. So what is Targi? Targi was developed in 1926 in Idaho. It is a U.S. born and raised and largely U.S. produced yarn. So, um, or wool, I should say. Sometimes it's yarn, sometimes it's fleece, sometimes other things. But um, it is a wool produced, created and produced mostly here in the United States. So it was developed in Idaho and it was actually developed by um, the U.S. Agricultural Center or whatever. They had some branch of them that was responsible for um, you know, breeding of animals and livestock and, and they were trying to come up with the ideal sheep. Does that ring a bell? Sounds like Polworth, right? So we talked about in New Zealand, they were trying to come up with the ideal sheep as well. And that's where they got Polworth, which was actually called the ideal sheep breed for a while. Like its official name was ideal instead of Polworth. And then it got changed later. Um, so similar kind of a thing in the U.S. U.S. suppliers were trying to come up with a U.S. bred dual purpose animal that they could use for quality wool but also for meat production and they were specifically looking for something that could be sturdier and withstand the northwestern United States kind of terrain and climate. So there's a lot of great farmland and um, grazing land up in the northwest corner of the United States. Think like Montana, the Dakotas, Idaho, Wyoming, some of those places and there's a lot of um, just great land for raising animals out there. And so back in the early 1900s, they had started, um, even before 1926, they were working on it, but that's kind of the year that they really came up with the, the beginnings of the Targi breed, what we now know as Targi. Um, but they were working on something that they could use to really help the farmers be able to produce a sheep that would fetch a good price at the market and that people would really, really want to use to kind of take over as a US-based supplier so we weren't having to import as much wool, but we could also get sheep that were sturdy and hardy and could withstand the climate up there. So they crossbred a bunch of different types of sheep, but they decided to take three quarters of, um, I hope you guys can't see that, Phoebe's been like running around in the background. She keeps walking underneath the camera and I don't think you could see her, but we're gonna have to check that and see. Um, so they took three quarters of fine wool breeds and mixed it with one quarter of a long wool breed, trying to get that kind of like perfect blend where they wanted it to be soft enough to use for knitting yarns and um, clothing and be like next to the skin soft for fleeces, but they also wanted the sturdiness and the good quality meat production of the long wool to kind of help balance out the finicky breeds like like merino we talked about is kind of finicky um you have to be a little bit more careful they can only survive in certain climates and they need very specialized care and they needed something that was just a little bit sturdier than that so they took um they ended up taking rambouillet lincoln corydale and those are the three main breeds that they ended up crossbreeding but they uh, over time by the 1940s a little bit of columbia sheep had also started to get incorporated into the breeding programs as well um, and then I believe it was in 1966, kind of mid to late 60s, that they were like, okay, that's it. We've hit on exactly what the, um, the breeding requirements are. They had developed the Targi breed enough now that only um, Targi born lambs were considered Targi from then on. So it was like official at that point. So they weren't like still, you know, any, any experimentation beyond that would be a new breed basically. So kind of came around through all of that. And um, 
they really did kind of create an ideal sheep. It really had some unique properties to the wool, but they were able to produce a pretty good meat um, quantity as well as quality. Although nowadays Targi is used primarily for wool production. It is mostly raised as a fiber producing animal. You can still get meat from it, but the majority of the flocks in the United States are raised for fiber production. Um, all the way from hand knitting yarns and like finer quality fleeces down to, you know, what they can use in carpets and things like that. So that's kind of where it came from, the history of it. I think it's really cool that it was developed in the United States by U.S. farmers and to this day continues to be largely a U.S. based breed. Um, I'm sure there are some Targi in other parts of the world, but they're mostly, most of the Targi, if not all of it, comes from the northwestern corner of the United States, which is pretty cool. And one thing I found in my research too that I thought was awesome was that the majority of Targi if you buy a Targi yarn or fleece, um, some spinning fiber at a festival or something, it is almost, almost definitely completely raised and processed in the United States. So the Targi wool was probably raised in the northwestern corner of the U.S. and then it was probably sent to a U.S. Um, mill to be washed and processed and spun if it's spun into yarn or even if it's just roving, it was processed most likely through a US-based mill or processor. So I thought that was really cool because that means that Targi is a really good way for us United States knitters and crocheters and crafters to keep everything kind of domestic and use our own national product and support our local economies. So Targi is a really good one. Go out and look for it. So let's talk about some of the actual characteristics of it. Um, so I did look up the micron count because I wasn't sure where it fell and it seems like the majority of it falls between 21 and 25 microns. So it's on the really fine end of medium wools or on kind of the slightly coarser end of the fine wools. To give you a reference point, remember when we talked about merino, it can range from 16 to 24, but the majority of merino is right around that 17 to 19 micron fineness, which is how we get that like super soft, super luxurious, like baby fine kind of fleece. So this is gonna be a little bit, a little bit coarser than that. It's not gonna be coarse wool by any means, but a little bit coarser than merino. Still definitely soft enough, you can use it for next to the skin items. Um, like sweaters and cowls and really great cushy stuff, um, but it's not quite as fine of a micron count. However, it does have a really nice high tight crimp, so it's got a lot of bounce and it has this great plush quality to it. It has three to five inch staple length, so significantly long staple length, which makes it really great for spinners to work with. It has a low luster and it's really, really great at felting, as long as it has not been super wash processed. Um, so Targi is actually one of the fibers that I sell in my shop for spinning fiber. Um, I sell Targi roving and I love dyeing Targi. It's so amazing. Um, the first time I did it, I could not believe how easy it was to dye. Spinning fiber for me is a lot harder to dye than yarn. And most of the dyers that I've talked to agree just because you have to handle it so much more gently. And, um, there's just a lot of considerations that you don't have to worry about with yarn that you do have to take into account with fiber because nobody wants to get crunched up, squished, matted, kind of felted, gross fiber in the mail. They want it to be fresh and plump and crisp looking and really, really soft and no felting at all so that they can spin from it and they have all these options, right? Of course, everybody wants a really great fiber, but it can be very difficult when you're hand dyeing that to keep it that way. And one of the things I love about Targi is it is so sturdy that it withstands even more handling than the majority of fibers. So I was used to being like, I started with like merino <laughs> and merino and silk. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I can barely breathe on this stuff. I have to like treat it like a newborn baby. And, um, and then I got Targi and I'm like handling it so carefully and it's just like, so easy and so it takes dye beautifully and one of the things I love about working with it as a dyer and as a spinner is it's so freaking plush and bouncy like it practically stands up and doesn't dance on your table it's so bouncy it's crazy I love 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 it so um that's one of the things I loved about dyeing it too is um in the dyeing process I just feel like you know I can squeeze some extra water out of it and it just springs back to life totally amazing elasticity. Probably the best elasticity I've worked with in roving as far as dyeing goes. Um, it's phenomenal. So 
Think about that when you're going to knit with it or crochet with it or weave with it. That's going to have incredible, incredible bounce, strength, elasticity, sturdiness. These are all adding up to a really great wearing yarn that's really good for any kind of item that's going to get a lot of wear, but is still soft enough to be next to your skin. So sweaters, especially cardigans, but even pullovers, sweaters are like gonna be amazing for Targi. Fingerless gloves is one of my very favorite things for it. Anything that um, can withstand abrasion and has that sturdiness to it and yet is soft enough that I just feel really happy when I put it on is perfect for fingerless gloves. Fingerless gloves are one of my very favorite things to knit and, and crochet. And I just love when I have something that's sturdy enough, I don't have to be so careful because I have done um, like a single ply merino one time, one of my worst stories ever. I used a lace weight single ply merino from a well-known reputable company and um, I knit these intricate, beautiful lace mitts and they were supposed to be like special occasion. I'm not gonna wear them every day. They're not for just whatever. They're special occasion mitts for fancy outfits and just going out with my hubby and stuff. And I wore them twice. And by the end of the second wearing, literally just driving in the car, driving my car, and then slipping them off carefully to eat dinner, slipping them on carefully to come home in the car and go to bed. And the second time they already had pilling, they were already starting to look worn and fuzzy, and it just wasn't great. Good lesson in what single ply is not good for and how to be careful with single ply. But also I was just like, man, this is really discouraging. These things, I put so much work into them and they're already like kind of nasty. So anytime I get something that is like plush and feels phenomenal against my skin, but it's also got like that sturdiness of Targi, oh my gosh, sign me up. I'm making fingerless gloves because that's gonna be amazing. Also socks, anything that gets a lot of abrasion, you need that sturdiness for. So these are some things you can do with your Targi. I would love to hear if you have knit with Targi before or you have hand spun Targi, what did you make with your yarn? I would really like to know what you are creating with your Targi to give me some great ideas. So speaking of spinning, um, we talked about the long staple length makes it great for spinners, but another thing um, that makes Targi so much fun to spin is, again, it takes dye amazingly, so you can get really beautiful hand dyed Targi, but it can be spun worsted or woolen, and it is equally as awesome. So it really doesn't matter. You have so many options. It's highly versatile. And um, I looked up several sources online because I am still a baby spinner. I haven't done a lot, so I was like, I just want to know, like, in general, what are more experienced spinners saying about this? And literally everybody was like, you know, I can't, I can't really decide. I think I like this better, but you know, either one is great. Most people were like, I do both. I just switch back and forth based on what I'm doing with the yarn or what mood I'm in that day, but it really works out great either way. Um, I had so many people say that Targi was one of their favorites to work with because it is just so forgiving and easy. It's just so easy. It's ideal. <laughs> So if you haven't tried spinning and you are a spinner, um, if you haven't tried spinning with Targi, I would highly recommend you give it a try because it's amazing. Another thing I like as a spinner is it's very easy to find hand dyed Targi. First of all, because it's so easy to work with, dyers love it. And secondly of all, it's so easy to find it at an affordable price point. In, um, excuse me, in my experience, Targi usually is at least a couple dollars, if not quite a bit, lower than like Merino or Polworth. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. It must just be um, the amount of fiber the animal produces and maybe like the cost of raising the animal or something, I don't know. But I find that when I purchase from my wholesalers, Targi is significantly cheaper than Merino and some of the finer blends. And um, when I sell it in my shop, because of that, it costs me less to get, so it costs you less to purchase from me. And so a braid of um, like a Merino blend, Merino silk blend maybe, or a, a superwash Merino might be 22 to $25 for a four ounce braid in my shop, hand dyed. Targi, the same weight and the same type of dyeing process, even the same colors, you're probably gonna be spending about 16 to $18. So you can save a little bit of money there and still get a really great high quality product that just feels amazing, spins up beautifully and is awesome. So I highly recommend you check that out as well. So one of the things I found really interesting when I was looking this up too is that Targi are a really large sheep. Um, that was mentioned by several people when I was looking up information on the breed and like where it came from. They were talking about how it's just very large sheep. And so I think that may be part of why the wool is affordable is that it just produces a lot and it produces a lot of meat that way. So it really kind of is the ideal sheep. So, um, yeah, I think that's about all I had to say on the actual characteristics, but I did have a couple of interesting quotes I wanted to leave you guys with when I was doing my research. So I mentioned Clara Parks' Book of Wool. 
I've been using that as my primary resource for this wool series. And then I also have been looking up some online resources and some other books from time to time to help flesh that out a little bit more. But she gives a really good overview if you're just wanting, it's not like super in-depth stuff you don't need to know. It's all very interesting. She gives really short little one or two paragraph snippets about different breeds. And then um, the book has patterns knitting patterns um, and it has more information about like selecting different wool breeds and blends and like what you look for and all these different things so I highly recommend the book if you haven't checked it out but one of the things that just made me like laugh out loud when I was reading it um, researching this podcast is she mentioned that um, Targi fleece is very plush and elastic and she said think about um, like a well yeasted bread dough after it's like raised up and you're kind of like kneading it and working it and it's just really like super stretchy elastic it's really plump and squishy and you just want to like get your fingers in there and squish it right so I don't know if you guys make bread at all but um, my mom used to make a lot of bread when I was growing up and so I don't make it a ton because I just don't have the time but I do a little bit and I loved that metaphor because that was super clear to me and just made me like oh yeah now I just want to go knit some targi because that just sounds fun like I always kind of loved the part of kneading the bread when you just got to get your fingers in there and squish that squishy elastic fun plump dough and that's that's how she describes working with targi fabric like a knitted targi fabric and I thought gosh dang it I want a targi sweater now that sounds amazing so that one was interesting and then I'm gonna have to read you this other quote because it was so long I couldn't memorize it but um from the fleece and fiber source book which is another really great resource especially if you're a spinner but even if you're just a knitter or crocheter um it's really really great it has all kinds of interesting information about animals and their fleeces and just how to appreciate and use different types of fiber. So in the Fleece and Fiber source book, she says, Targi wool has loft and good elasticity of the sort that makes it lively and supple rather than springy. It produces fabrics you'll want to wrap yourself in both for softness and a bit of elegance. Mm. Don't you just really want to go get some Targi now? I do. <laughs> So unfortunately, I do not currently have any Targi yarn in my shop. Um, it is a little bit harder to find, and I don't currently have it. As much as I would love to offer you every kind of wool that we talk about on the podcast, I'm a tiny little startup business, and I just don't have the inventory, storage, or money right now to stock everything all the time. But I will try to bring in little bits here and there. Um, but I do keep Targi spinning fiber currently in my shop, and there is some right now. So go check out my spinning fiber if you are a spinner or any kind of like needle filter, or if you wanna work with just the, the fiber to felt it up directly from the braid instead of knitting it and then felting it. Um, but if you're a knitter looking for yarn, you should definitely just go check it out, Google it, see what you can find. I will say I've personally only found like 100% Targi right now. I'm sure there are Targi blends out there. I haven't done a lot of research on that yet, but I'd be really interested to see if you guys have found a Targi blend yarn or if you've spun your own Targi blended with something else. I would love to know what are you blending your Targi with and what do you like about it or not like about it? What is it good for? Um, like what other fibers have you used? Have you knitted something and used it? And if so, like what did you find worked well or didn't work about it? Please, please, please help educate me and help educate each other by leaving me a comment telling me what you love about Targi, what you use it for, what you blend it with, if you've tried knitting with it, spinning with it, etc. And yeah, that's about all I have for you today on Targi. But thank you guys for sticking in with me, listening to another wool series. I am so happy to have had so many comments from you guys about how much you guys are loving this series. I was really hoping it would be good, but I was a little bit like, this could be kind of boring for some people and I'm not sure everybody's going to love it. But I've had so many overwhelmingly great comments of people just saying they love it and they want more. So I don't know how long it's going to go. I can guarantee you we won't get through every sheep breed out there because there's over 200. And I just don't think I'm going to have the stamina to do that. <laughs> but I am loving what we've gotten done. And I'm gonna, I do have several more that I'm going to be bringing to you um, as well. In, in the future. So we probably will take a few more breaks as well to talk about other stuff. So we're not going to just do wool series, but we do have more wool series coming. But that's about all I have for you today. It is now time to cast off. Love you.